the willow walk by st clair lewis this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading by matt Berard. part one from the drawer of his table jasper holt took a pane of window glass he laid a sheet of paper on the glass and wrote now is the time for all good men to come to the aid of their party he studied his round business college script and rewrote the sentence in a small finicky hand that of a studious old man ten times he copied the words in that false pinched writing he tore up the paper burned the fragments in his large ash tray and washed the delicate ashes down his stationary wash bowl he replaced the pane of glass in the drawer tapping it with satisfaction a glass underlay does not retain an impression jasper holt was as nearly respectable as his room which with its frilled chairs and pansy painted pincushion was the best in the aristocratic boarding-house of mrs lyons he was a wiry slightly bald black-haired man of thirty-eight wearing an easy gray flannel suit and a white carnation his hands were peculiarly compact and nimble he gave the appearance of being a youngish lawyer or bond salesman actually he was senior paying teller in the lumber national bank in the city of vernon he looked at a thin expensive gold watch it was six thirty on wednesday toward dusk of a tranquil spring day he picked up his hooked walking stick and his gray silk gloves and trudged downstairs he met his landlady in the lower hall and inclined his head she effusively commented on the weather i shall not be there for dinner he said amiably very well mr holt my but aren't you always going out with your swell friends though i read in the herald that you were going to be a star in another of those society plays in the community theatre i guess you'd be an actor if you wasn't a banker mr holt no i'm afraid i haven't much temperament his voice was cordial but his smile was a mere mechanical sideways twist of the lip muscles you're the one that's got the stage presence but you'd be a regular ethel barrymore if you didn't have to take care of us my but you're such a flatterer he bowed his way out and walked sedately down the street to a public garage nodding to the night attendant but saying nothing he started his roadster and drove out of the garage away from the centre of vernon toward the suburb of rosebank he did not go directly to rosebank he went seven blocks out of his way and halted on fandall avenue one of those petty main thoroughfares which with their motion-picture palaces their groceries laundries undertakers establishments and lunch-rooms serve as local centres for districts of mean residences he got out of the car and pretended to look at the tires kicking them to see how much air they had while he did so he covertly looked up and down the street he saw no one whom he knew he went into the parthenon confectionery store the parthenon store makes a specialty of those ingenious candy boxes that resemble bound books the back of the box is of imitation leather with a stamping simulating the title of a novel the edges are apparently the edges of a number of pages but these pages are hollowed out and the inside is to be filled with candy jasper gazed at the collection of book boxes and chose the two whose titles had the nearest approach to dignity sweets to the sweet and the ladies delight he asked the greek clerk to fill these with the less expensive grade of mixed chocolates and to wrap them from the candy shop he went to the drug store that carried an assortment of reprinted novels and from these picked out two of the same sentimental type as the titles on the book-like boxes these also he had wrapped he strolled out of the drug store slipped into a lunchroom got a lettuce sandwich doughnuts and a cup of coffee at the greasy marble counter took them to a chair with a table arm in the dim rear of the lunchroom and hastily devoured them as he came out and returned to his car he again glanced along the street 
he fancied that he knew a man who was approaching he could not be sure from the breast up the man seemed familiar as did the customers of the bank whom he viewed through the wicket of the teller's window when he saw them in the street he could never be sure of them it seemed extraordinary to find that these persons who to him were nothing but faces with attached arms that held out checks and received money could walk about had legs and a gait and a manner of their own he walked to the curb and stared up at the cornice of one of the stores puckering his lips giving an impersonation of a man inspecting a building with the corner of an eye he followed the approaching man the man ducked his head as he neared and greeted him hello brother teller jasper seemed startled gave the oh oh how are you of sudden recognition and mumbled looking after a little bank property the man passed on jasper got into his car and drove back to the street that would take him out to the suburb of rosebank as he left phantom avenue he peered at his watch it was five minutes to seven at a quarter past seven he passed through the main street of rosebank and turned into a lane that was but little changed since the time when it had been a country road a few jerry-built villas of freckled paint did shoulder upon it but for the most part it ran through swamps spotted with willow groves the spongy ground covered with scatterings of dry leaves and bark opening on this lane was a dim rutted grassy private road which disappeared into one of the willow groves jasper sharply swung his car between the crumbly gate-posts and along on the bumpy private road he made an abrupt turn came in sight of an unpainted shed and shot the car into it without cutting down his speed so that he almost hit the back of the shed with his front fenders he shut off the engine climbed out quickly and ran back toward the gate from the shield of the bank of alder bushes he peered out two clattering women were going down the public road they stared in through the gate and half halted that's where the hermit lives said one of them oh you mean the one that's writing a religious book and never comes out till evening some kind of preacher yes that's the one john holt i think his name is i guess he's kind of crazy he lives in the old Bodette house but you can't see it from here it's clear through the block on the next street i heard he was crazy but i just saw an automobile go in here oh that's his cousin or brother or something lives in the city they say he's rich and such a nice fellow the two women ambled on their clatter blurring with distance standing behind the alders jasper rubbed the palm of one hand with the fingers of the other the palm was dry with nervousness but he grinned he returned to the shed and entered a brick paved walk almost a block long walled and sheltered by overhanging willows once it had been a pleasant path carved wooden benches were placed along it and it widened to a court with a rock garden a fountain and a stone bench the rock garden had degenerated into a riot of creepers sprawling over the sharp stones the paint had peeled from the fountain leaving its iron cupids and nids eaten with rust the bricks of the wall were smeared with lichens and moss and were untidy with windrows of dry leaves and caked earth many of the bricks were broken the walk was hilly in its unevenness from willows and bricks and scuffled earth rose a damp chill but jasper did not seem to note the dampness he hastened along the walk to the house a structure of heavy stone which for this newish midwestern land was very ancient it had been built by a french fur trader in eighteen thirty nine the chippewas had scalped a man in its dooryard the heavy back door was guarded by an unexpectedly expensive modern lock jasper opened it with a flat key and closed it behind him it locked on a spring he was in a crude kitchen the shades of which were drawn he passed through the kitchen and dining-room into the living-room dodging chairs and tables in the darkness as though he was used to them he went to each of the three windows of the living-room and made sure that all the shades were down before he lighted the student lamp on the game-leg table 
as the glow crept over the drab walls jasper bobbed his head with satisfaction nothing had been touched since his last visit the room was musty with the smell of old green rep upholstery and leather books it had not been dusted for months dust sheeted the stiff red velvet chairs the uncomfortable settee the chill white marble fireplace the immense glass-fronted bookcase that filled one side of the room the atmosphere was unnatural to this capable business man this jasper holt but jasper did not seem oppressed he briskly removed the wrappers from the genuine books and from the candy box imitations of books one of the two wrappers he laid on the table and smoothed out upon this he poured the candy from the two boxes the other wrapper and the strings he stuffed into the fireplace and immediately burned crossing to the bookcase he unlocked one section on the bottom shelf there was a row of rather cheap-looking novels on this shelf and of these at least six were actually such candy boxes as he had purchased that evening only one shelf of the bookcase was given over to anything so frivolous as novels the others were filled with black-covered speckle-leaved dismal books of history theology biography the shabby genteel sort of books you find on the fifteen-cent table at a second-hand bookshop over these jasper poured for a moment as though he was memorizing their titles he took down the life of rev jeremiah baldfish and read aloud in those intimate discourses with his family that followed evening prayers i once heard brother baldfish observe that philo judaeus whose scholarly career always calls to mind the adumbrations of melancthon upon the essence of rationalism was a mere sophist jasper slammed the book shut remarking contentedly that'll do philo judaeus good name to spring he relocked the bookcase and went upstairs in a small bedroom at the right of the upper hall an electric light was burning presumably the house had been deserted till jasper's entrance but a prowler in the yard might have judged from this ever-burning light that someone was in the residence the bedroom was spartan an iron bed one straight chair a washstand a heavy oak bureau jasper scrambled to unlock the bottom drawer of the bureau yank it open take out a wrinkled chinese suit of black a pair of black shoes a small black bow tie a gladstone collar a white shirt with starched bosom a speckly brown felt hat and a wig an expensive and excellent wig with artfully unkempt hair of a faded brown he stripped off his attractive flannel suit wing collar blue tie custom-made silk shirt and cordovan shoes and speedily put on the wig and those gloomy garments as he donned them the corners of his mouth began to droop leaving the light on and his own clothes flung on the bed he descended the stairs he was obviously not the same jasper but less healthy less practical less agreeable and decidedly more aware of the sorrow and long thoughts of the dreamer indeed it must be understood that now he was not jasper holt but jasper's twin brother john holt hermit and religious fanatic end of part one of the willow walk by sinclair lewis Part two of The Willow Walk by Sinclair Lewis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Part two. John Holt, twin brother of Jasper Holt, the bank teller, rubbed his eyes as though he had for hours been absorbed in study and crawled through the living room, through the tiny hall to the front door. He opened it, picked up a couple of circulars that the postman had dropped through the letter slot in the door, went out and locked the door behind him. He was facing a narrow front yard, neater than the willow walk at the back, on a suburban street more populous than the straggly back lane. A street arc illuminated the yard and showed that a card was tacked on the door. John touched the card, 
snapped it with a nail of his finger to make sure it was securely tacked in that light he could not read it but he knew that it was inscribed in a small finicky hand agents kindly do not disturb bell will not be answered occupant of the house engaged in literary work john stood on the doorstep until he made out his neighbor on the right a large stolid commuter who was walking before his house smoking an after-dinner cigar john poked to the fence and sniffed at a spray of lilac blossoms till the neighbor called over nice evening yes it seems to be pleasant john's voice was like jasper's but it was more guttural and his speech had less assurance how's the story going it is it is very difficult so hard to comprehend all the inner meanings of the prophecies well i must be hastening to soul hope hall i trust we will see you there some wednesday or sunday evening i bid you good night sir john wavered down the street to the drug store he purchased a bottle of ink in a grocery that kept open evenings he got two pounds of cornmeal two pounds of flour a pound of bacon a half pound of butter six eggs and a can of condensed milk shall we deliver them asked the clerk john looked at him sharply he realized that this was a new man who did not know his customs he said rebukingly no i always carry my parcels i am writing a book i am never to be disturbed he paid for the provisions out of a postal money order for thirty-five dollars and received the change the cashier of the store was accustomed to cashing these money orders which were always sent to john from south vernon by one r j smith john took the bundle of food and walked out of the store that fellow's kind of a nut isn't he asked the new clerk the cashier explained yep doesn't even take fresh milk uses condensed for everything what do you think of that and they say he burns up all his garbage never has anything in the ash can except ashes if you knock at his door he never answers it fellow told me all the time writing this book of his religious crank i guess has a little income though guess his folks were pretty well fixed comes out once in a while in the evening and pokes round town we used to laugh about him but we've kind of got used to him been here about a year i guess it is john was serenely passing down the main street of rosebank at the dingier end of it he turned in at a hallway marked by a lighted sign announcing in crude house painter's letters soul hope fraternity hall experience meeting all welcome it was eight o'clock the members of the soul hope cult had gathered in their hall above a bakery theirs was a tiny tight-minded sect they asserted that they alone obeyed the scriptural tenets that they alone were certain to be saved that all other denominations were damned by unapostolic luxury that it was wicked to have organs or ministers or any meeting places save plain halls the members themselves conducted the meetings one after another rising to give an interpretation of the scriptures or to rejoice in gathering with the faithful while the others commented with hallelujah and amen brother amen they were plainly dressed not overfed somewhat elderly and a rather happy congregation the most honored of them all was john holt john had come to rosebank only eleven months before he had bought the Baudet house with the library of the recent occupant a retired clergyman and had paid for them in new one hundred dollar bills already he had a great credit in the sole hope cult it appeared that he spent almost all his time at home praying and reading and writing a book the sole hope fraternity was excited about the book they had begged him to read it to them so far he had only read a few pages consisting mostly of quotations from ancient treatises on the prophecies nearly every sunday and wednesday evening he appeared at the meeting and in a halting and scholarly way lectured on the world and the flesh to-night he spoke polysyllabically of the fact that one philo judaeus had been a mere sophist the cult were none too clear as to what either a philo judaeus or a sophist might be but with heads all nodding in a row they murmured you're right brother hallelujah 
john glided into a sad earnest discourse on his worldly brother jasper and informed them of his struggles with jasper's itch for money by his request the fraternity prayed for jasper the meeting was over at nine john shook hands all round with the elders of the congregation sighing fine meeting to-night wasn't it such a free outpouring of the spirit he welcomed a new member a servant girl just come from seattle carrying his groceries and a bottle of ink he poked down the stairs from the hall at seven minutes after nine at sixteen minutes after nine john was stripping off his brown wig and the funereal clothes in his bedroom at twenty-eight after john holt had become jasper holt the capable teller of the lumber national bank jasper holt left the light burning in his brother's bedroom he rushed downstairs tried the fastening on the front door bolted it made sure that all the windows were fastened picked up the bundle of groceries and the pile of candies that he had removed from the book-like candy boxes blew out the light in the living room and ran down the willow walk to his car he threw the groceries and candy into it backed the car out as though he was accustomed to backing in this bough-scattered yard and drove along the lonely road at the rear when he was passing a swamp he reached down picked up the bundle of candies and steering with one hand removed the wrapping paper with the other hand and hurled out the candies they showered along the weeds beside the road the paper which had contained the candies and upon which was printed the name of the parthenon confectionery store jasper tucked into his pocket he took the groceries item by item from the labeled bag containing them thrust that bag also into his pocket and laid the groceries on the seat beside him on the way from rosebank to the center of the city of vernon he again turned off the main avenue and halted at a goat-infested shack occupied by a crippled norwegian he sounded the horn the norwegian's grandson ran out here's a little more grub for you bawled jasper god bless you sir i don't know what we'd do if it wasn't for you cried the old norwegian from the door but jasper did not wait for gratitude he merely shouted bring you some more in a couple of days as he started away at a quarter past ten he drove up to the hall that housed the latest interest in vernon society the community theatre the boulevard set the best people in town belonged to the community theatre association and the leader of it was the daughter of the general manager of the railroad as a well-bred bachelor jasper holt was welcome among them despite the fact that no one knew much about him except that he was a good bank teller and had been born in england but as an actor he was not merely welcome he was the best amateur actor in vernon his placid face could narrow with tragic emotion or puff out with comedy his placid manner concealed a dynamo of emotion unlike most amateur actors he did not try to act he became the thing itself he forgot jasper holt and turned into a vagrant or a judge a bernard shaw thought a lord dunsany symbol a null coward man about town the other one-act plays of the next program of the community theatre had already been rehearsed the cast of the play in which jasper was to star were all waiting for him so were the ladies responsible for the staging they wanted his advice about the blue curtain for the stage window about the baby spot that was out of order about the higher interpretation of the role of the page in the piece a role consisting of only two lines but to be played by one of the most popular girls in the younger set after the discussions and a most violent quarrel between two members of the play reading committee the rehearsal was called jasper holt still wore his flannel suit and wilting carnation but he was not jasper he was the duc de saint saba a cynical gracious gorgeous old man easy of gesture tranquil of voice shudderingly evil of desire if i could get a few more actors like you cried the professional coach the rehearsal was over at half past eleven jasper drove his car to the public garage in which he kept it and walked home there he tore up and burned the wrapping paper bearing the name of the parthenon confectionery store and the labeled bag that had contained the groceries 
the community theatre plays were given on the following wednesday jasper hold was highly applauded and at the party at the lakeside country club after the play he danced with the prettiest girls in town he hadn't much to say to them but he danced fervently and about him was a halo of artistic success that night his brother john did not appear at the meeting of the sole hope fraternity out in rosebank on monday five days later while he was in conference with the president and the cashier of the lumber national bank jasper complained of a headache the next day he telephoned to the president that he would not come down to work he would stay home and rest his eyes sleep and get rid of the persistent headache that was unfortunate for that very day his twin brother made one of his frequent trips into vernon and called at the bank the president had seen john only once before and by a coincidence it had happened on this occasion also jasper had been absent had been out of town the president invited john into his private office your brother is at home poor fellow has a bad headache i hope he gets over it we think a great deal of him here you ought to be proud of him will you have a smoke as he spoke the president looked john over once or twice when jasper and the president had been out at lunch jasper had spoken of the remarkable resemblance between himself and his twin brother but the president told himself that he didn't really see much resemblance the features of the two were alike but john's expression of chronic spiritual indigestion his unfriendly manner and his hair unkempt and lifeless brown where jasper's was sleekly black about a shiny bald spot made the president dislike john as much as he liked jasper and now john was replying no i do not smoke i can't understand how a man can soil the temple with drugs i suppose i ought to be glad to hear you praise poor jasper but i am more concerned with his lack of respect for the things of the spirit he sometimes comes to see me at rosebank and i argue with him but somehow i can't make him see his errors and his flippant ways we don't think he's flippant we think he's a pretty steady worker but he's play-acting and reading love stories well i try to keep in mind the injunction judge not that ye be not judged but i am pained to find my own brother giving up immortal promises for mortal amusements well i'll go and call on him i trust that some day we shall see you at sol hope hall in rosebank good day sir turning back to his work the president grumbled i am going to tell jasper that the best compliment i can hand him is that he is not like his brother and on the following day another wednesday when jasper reappeared at the bank the president did make this jesting comparison and jasper sighed oh john is really a good fellow but he's always gone in for metaphysics and oriental mysticism and lord knows what all till he's kind of lost in the fog but he's a lot better than i am when i murder my landlady or say when i rob the bank chief you go get john and i bet you the best lunch in town that he'll do his best to bring me to justice that's how square he is square yes corners just sticking out well when you do rob us jasper i'll look up john but do try to keep from robbing us as long as you can i hate to have to associate with a religious detective in a boiled shirt both men laughed and jasper went back to his cage his head continued to hurt he admitted the president advised him to lay off for a week he didn't want to he said with the new munition industries due to the war in europe there was much increase in factory payrolls and jasper took charge of them better take a week off than get ill argued the president late that afternoon jasper did let himself be persuaded to go away for at least a weekend he would run up north to wakeman lake the coming friday he said he would get some black bass fishing and be back on monday or tuesday before he went he would make up the payrolls for the saturday payments and turn them over to the other teller the president thanked him for his faithfulness and as was his not infrequent custom invited jasper to his house for the evening of the next day thursday 
that wednesday evening jasper's brother john appeared at the sole hope meeting in rosebank when he had gone home and magically turned back into jasper this jasper did not return the wig and garments of john to the bureau but packed them in a suitcase took the suitcase to his room in vernon and locked it in his wardrobe jasper was amiable at dinner at the president's house on thursday but he was rather silent and as his head still throbbed he left the house early at nine thirty sedately carrying his gray silk gloves in one hand and pompously swinging his stick with the other he walked from the president's house on the fashionable boulevard back to the center of vernon he entered the public garage in which he stored his car he commented to the night attendant headaches guess i'll take the bus out and get some fresh air he drove away at not more than fifteen miles an hour he headed south when he had reached the outskirts of the city he speeded up to a consistent twenty-five miles an hour he settled down in his seat with the unmoving steadiness of the long-distance driver his body quiet except for the tiny subtle movements of his foot on the accelerator of his hand on the steering wheel his right hand across the wheel holding it at the top his left elbow resting easily on the cushioned edge of his seat and his left hand merely touching the wheel he drove down in that southern direction for fifteen miles almost to the town of wanaguchi then by a rather poor side road he turned sharply to the north and west and making a huge circle about the city drove toward the town of st clair the suburb of rosebank in which his brother john lived is also north of vernon these directions were of some importance to him wanaguchi eighteen miles south of the mother city of vernon rosebank on the other hand eight miles north of vernon and st clair twenty miles north about as far north of vernon as wanaguchi is south on his way to st clair at a point that was only two miles from rosebank jasper ran the car off the main road into a grove of oaks and maples and stopped it on a long unused woodland road he stiffly got out and walked through the woods up a rise of ground to a cliff overlooking a swampy lake the gravelly farther bank of the cliff rose perpendicularly from the edge of the water in that wan light distilled by stars and the earth he made out the reedy expanse of the lake it was so muddy so tangled with sedge grass that it was never used for swimming and as its inhabitants were only slimy bullheads few people ever tried to fish there jasper stood reflective he was remembering the story of the farmer's team which had run away dashed over this cliff and sunk out of sight in the mud bottom of the lake swishing his stick he outlined an imaginary road from the top of the cliff back to the sheltered place where his car was standing once he hacked away with a large pocket-knife a mass of knotted hazel bushes which blocked that projected road when he had traced the road to his car he smiled he walked to the edge of the woods and looked up and down the main highway a car was approaching he waited till it had passed ran back to his own car backed it out on the highway and went on his northward course toward st clair driving about thirty miles an hour on the edge of st clair he halted took out his kit of tools unscrewed a spark plug and sharply tapping the plug on the engine block deliberately cracked the porcelain jacket he screwed the plug in again and started the car it bucked and spit missing on one cylinder with the short-circuited plug i guess there must be something wrong with the ignition he said cheerfully he managed to run the car into a garage in st clair there was no one in the garage save an old negro the night washer who was busy over a limousine with sponge and hose got a night repair man here asked jasper no sir guess you'll have to leave it till morning hang it something gone wrong with the carburetor of the ignition well i'll have to leave it then tell him say will you be here in the morning when the repairman comes on yes sir well tell him i must have the car by tomorrow noon no say by tomorrow at nine now don't forget this will help 
your memory he gave a quarter to the negro who grinned and shouted yes sir that'll help my memory a lot as he tied a storage tag on the car the negro inquired name uh my name oh hansen remember now ready about nine tomorrow jasper walked to the railroad station it was ten minutes of one jasper did not ask the night operator about the next train into vernon apparently he knew that there was a train stopping here at st clair at one thirty seven he did not sit in the waiting room but in the darkness outside on a truck behind the baggage room when the train came in he slipped into the last seat of the last car and with his soft hat over his eyes either slept or appeared to sleep when he reached vernon he got off and came to the garage in which he regularly kept his car he stepped inside the night attendant was drowsing in a large wooden chair tilted back against the wall in the narrow runway which formed the entrance to the garage jasper jovially shouted to the attendant certainly ran into some hard luck ignition went wrong i guess it was that ignition had to leave the car down at wanaguchi hard luck all right assented the attendant yump so i left it at wanaguchi jasper emphasized as he passed on he had been inexact in this statement it was not at wanaguchi which is south but at st clair which is north that he had left his car he had returned to his boarding house slept beautifully hummed in his morning shower bath yet at breakfast he complained of his continuous headache and announced that he was going up north to wakeman to get some bass fishing and rest his eyes his landlady urged him to go anything i can do to help you get away she queried no thanks i'm just taking a couple of suitcases with some old clothes and some fishing tackle fact i have em all packed already i'll probably take the noon train north if i can get away from the bank pretty busy now with these payrolls for the factories that have war contracts for the allies what's it say in the paper this morning jasper arrived at the bank carrying the two suitcases and a neat polite rolled silk umbrella the silver top of which was engraved with his name the doorman who was also the bank guard helped him to carry the suitcases inside careful of that bag got my fishing tackle in it said jasper to the doorman apropos of one of the suitcases which was heavy but apparently not packed full well i think i'll run up to wakeman to-day and catch a few bass wish i could go along sir how is the head this morning does it still ache asked the doorman rather better but my eyes still feel pretty rocky guess i've been using them too much say connors i'll try to catch the train north at eleven seven better have a taxicab here for me at eleven or no i'll let you know a little before eleven try to catch the eleven seven north for wakeman very well sir the president the cashier the chief clerk all asked jasper how he felt and to all of them he repeated the statement that he had been using his eyes too much and that he would catch a few bass at wakeman the other paying teller from his cage next to that of jasper called heartily through the steel netting pretty soft for some people you wait i'm going to have the hay fever this summer and i'll go fishing for a month jasper placed the two suitcases and the umbrella in his cage and leaving the other teller to pay out current money he himself made up the payrolls for the next day saturday he casually went into the vault a narrow unimpressive unaired cell with a hard linoleum floor one unshaded electric bulb and a back wall composed entirely of steel doors of safes all painted a sickly blue very unimpressive but guarding several millions of dollars in cash and securities the upper doors hung on large steel arms and each provided with two dials could be opened only by two officers of the bank each knowing one of the two combinations below these were smaller doors one of which jasper could open as teller it was the door of an insignificant steel box which contained one hundred and seventeen thousand dollars in bills and four thousand dollars in gold and silver jasper passed back and forth carrying bundles of currency in his cage 
he was working less than three feet from the other teller who was divided from him only by the bands of the steel netting while he worked he exchanged a few words with this other teller once as he counted out nineteen thousand dollars he commented big payroll for the henschel wagon works this week they're making gun carriages and truck bodies for the allies i understand uh-huh said the other teller not much interested mechanically unobtrusively going on about his ordinary routine of business jasper counted out bills to amounts agreeing with the items on a typed schedule of the payrolls apparently his eyes never lifted from his counting and from the type schedule which lay before him the bundles of bills he made into packages fastening each with a paper band each bundle he seemed to drop into a small black leather bag which he held beside him but he did not actually drop the money into these payroll bags both the suitcases at his feet were closed and presumably fastened but one was not fastened and though it was heavy it contained nothing but a lump of pig iron from time to time jasper's hand holding a bundle of bills dropped to his side with a slight movement of his foot he opened that suitcase and the bills slipped from his hand down into it the bottom part of the cage was a solid sheet of stamped steel and from the front of the bag no one could see this suspicious gesture the other teller could have seen it but jasper dropped the bills only when the other teller was busy talking to a customer or when his back was turned in order to delay for such a favorable moment jasper frequently counted packages of bills twice rubbing his eyes as though they hurt him after each of these secret disposals and packages of bills jasper made much of dropping into the payroll bags the rolls of coin for which the schedule called it was while he was tossing these blue wrapped cylinders of coin into the bags that he would chat with the other teller then he would lock up the bags and gravely place them at one side jasper was so slow in making up the payrolls that it was five minutes of eleven before he finished he called the doorman to the cage and suggested better call my taxi now he still had one bag to fill he could plainly be seen dropping packages of money into it while he instructed the assistant teller i'll stick all the bags in my safe and you can transfer them to yours be sure to lock my safe lord i better hurry or i'll miss my train be back tuesday morning at latest so long take care of yourself he hastened to pile the payroll bags into his safe in the vault the safe was almost filled with them and except for the last one not one of the bags contained anything except a few rolls of coin though he had told the other teller to lock his safe he himself twirled the combination which was thoughtless of him as the assistant manager would now have to wait and get the president to unlock it he picked up his umbrella and two suitcases bending over one of the cases for not more than ten seconds waving good-bye to the cashier at his desk down front and hurrying so fast that the doorman did not have a chance to help him carry the suitcases he rushed through the bank through the door into the waiting taxicab and loudly enough for the doorman to hear he cried to the driver m and d station at the m and d railroad station refusing offers of redcaps to carry his bags he bought a ticket for wackerman which is a lake resort town one hundred and forty miles northwest of vernon hence one hundred and twenty beyond st clair he had just time to get aboard the eleven seven train he did not take a chair car but sat in a day coach near the rear door he unscrewed the silver top of his umbrella on which was engraved his name and dropped it into his pocket when the train reached st clair jasper strolled out to the vestibule carrying the suitcases but leaving the topless umbrella behind his face was blank uninterested as the train started he dropped down on the station platform and gravely walked away for a second the light of adventure crossed his face and vanished at the garage at which he had left his car on the evening before he asked the foreman did you get my car fixed mercury roadster ignition on the bum nope couple of jobs ahead of it haven't had time to touch it yet ought to get at it early this afternoon 
jasper curled his tongue round his lips in startled vexation he dropped his suitcases on the floor of the garage and stood thinking his bent forefinger against his lower lip then well i guess i can get her to go sorry can't wait got to make the next town he grumbled lot of you traveling salesmen making your territory my motor now mr hansen said the foreman civilly glancing at the storage check on jasper's car yep i can make a good many more than i could by train he paid for overnight storage without complaining though since his car had not been repaired this charge was unjust in fact he was altogether prosaic and inconspicuous he thrust the suitcases into the car and drove away the motor spinning at another garage he bought another spark plug and screwed it in when he went on the motor had ceased spitting he drove out of st clair back in the direction of vernon and of rosebank where his brother lived he ran the car into that thick grove of oaks and maples only two miles from rosebank where he had paced off an imaginary road to the cliff overhanging the reedy lake he parked his car in a grassy space beside the abandoned woodland road he laid a light robe over the suitcases from beneath the seat he took a can of deviled chicken a box of biscuits a canister of tea a folding cooking kit and a spirit lamp these he spread on the grass a picnic lunch he sat beside that lunch for seven minutes past one in the afternoon till dark once in a while he made a pretense of eating he fetched water from the brook made tea opened the box of biscuits and the can of chicken but mostly he sat still and smoked cigarette after cigarette once a swede taking this road as a shortcut to his truck farm passed by and mumbled picnic eh yep taking the day off said jasper dully the man went on without looking back at dusk jasper finished a cigarette down to the tip crushed out the light and made the cryptic remark that's probably jasper holt's last smoke i don't suppose you can smoke john damn you he hid the two suitcases in the bushes piled the remains of the lunch into the car took down the top of the car and crept down to the main road no one was in sight he returned he snatched a hammer and a chisel from his tool kit and with a few savage cracks he so defaced the number of the car stamped on the engine block that it could not be made out he removed the license numbers from fore and aft and placed them beside the suitcases then when there was just enough light to see the bushes as cloudy masses he started the car drove through the woods and up the incline to the top of the cliff and halted leaving the engine running between the car and the edge of the cliff which overhung the lake there was a space of about one hundred and thirty feet fairly level and covered with straggly red clover jasper paced off this distance returned to the car took his seat in a nervous tentative way and put her into gear starting on second speed and slamming her into third the car bolted toward the edge of the cliff he instantly swung out on the running board standing there heading directly toward the sharp drop over the cliff steering with his left hand on the wheel he shoved the hand throttle up 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 with his right he safely leapt down from the running board of itself the car rushed forward roaring it shot over the edge of the cliff it soared twenty feet out into the air as though it were a thick-bodied aeroplane he turned over and over with a sickening drop toward the lake the water splashed up in a tremendous noisy circle then silence in the twilight the surface of the lake shone like milk there was no sign of the car on the surface the concentric rings died away the lake was secret and sinister and still lord ejaculated jasper standing on the cliff then well they won't find that for a couple of years anyway he turned to the suitcases squatting beside them he took from one the wig and black garments of john holt he stripped put on the clothes of john and packed those of jasper in the bag with the cases and the motor license plates he walked towards rosebank keeping in various groves of maples and willows till he was within half a mile of the town he reached the stone house at the end of the willow walk and sneaked in the back way he burned jasper holt's clothes in the grate 
melted down the license plates in the stove and between two rocks he smashed jasper's expensive watch and fountain pen into an unpleasant mass of junk which he dropped into the cistern for rainwater the silver head of the umbrella he scratched with a chisel till the engraved name was indistinguishable he unlocked a section of the bookcase and taking a number of packages of bills in denominations of one five ten and twenty dollars from one of the suitcases he packed them into those empty candy boxes which on the shelves looked so much like books as he stored them he counted the bills they came to ninety seven thousand five hundred and thirty five dollars the two suitcases were new there were no distinguishing marks on them but taking them out to the kitchen he kicked them rubbed them with lumps of blacking rabbled their edges and cut their sides till they gave the appearance of having been long and badly used in travelling he took them upstairs and tossed them up into the low attic in his bedroom he undressed calmly once he laughed i despise those pretentious fools bank officers and cops i'm beyond their fool law no one can catch me it would take me myself to do that he got into bed with a vexed hang it he mused i suppose john would pray no matter how chilly the floor was he got out of bed and from the inscrutable lord of the universe he sought forgiveness not for jasper holt but for the denominations who lacked the true faith of soul hope fraternity he returned to bed and slept till the middle of the morning lying with his arms behind his head a smile on his face thus did jasper holt without the mysterious pangs of death yet cease to exist and thus did john holt come into being not merely as an apparition glimpsed on sunday and wednesday evenings but as a being living twenty-four hours a day seven days a week End of part two of the willow walk by sinclair lewis part three of the Willow Walk by Sinclair Lewis. The Celebrivox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. The inhabitants of Rosebank were familiar with the occasional appearances of John Holt, the eccentric recluse, and they merely snickered about him. When on the Saturday evening following the Friday that has been chronicled, he was seen to come out of his gate and trudge down to a news and stationery shop on main street he purchased an evening paper and said to the clerk you can have the morning herald delivered at my house every morning twenty seven humbert avenue yet yeah, i know where it is thought you had kind of a grouch on newspapers said the clerk pertly ah did you indeed the herald every morning please i will pay a month in advance was all john holt said but he looked directly at the clerk and the man cringed john attended the meeting of the soul hope fraternity the next evening sunday but he was not seen on the streets again for two and a half days there was no news of the disappearance of jasper holt till the following wednesday when the whole thing came out in a violent small city front page story headed paying teller social favorite makes getaway the paper stated that jasper holt had been missing for four days and that the officers of the bank at first denying that there was anything wrong with his accounts had admitted that he was short one hundred thousand dollars two hundred thousand said one report he had purchased a ticket for wakaman this state on friday and a trainman a customer of the bank had noticed him on the train but he had apparently never arrived at wakaman a woman asserted that on friday afternoon she had seen holt driving an automobile between vernon and st clair this appearance near st clair was supposed to be merely a blind however in fact our able chief of police had proof that holt was not headed north in the direction of st clair but south beyond wanaguchi probably for des moines or st louis it was definitely known that on the previous day holt had left his car at wanaguchi and with their customary thoroughness and promptness the police were making search at wanaguchi the chief had already communicated with the police in cities to the south 
and the capture of the man could confidently be expected at any moment as long as the chief appointed by our popular mayor was in power it went ill with those who gave even the appearance of wrong-doing when asked his opinion of the theory that the alleged fugitive had gone north the chief declared that of course holt had started in that direction with the vain hope of throwing pursuers off the scent but that he had immediately turned south and picked up his car though he would not say so definitely the chief let it be known that he was ready to put his hands on the fellow who had hidden holt's car at wanaguchi when asked if he thought holt was crazy the chief laughed and said yes he's crazy two hundred thousand dollars worth i'm not making any slams but there's a lot of fellows among our political opponents who would go a whole lot crazier for a whole lot less the president of the bank however was greatly distressed and strongly declared his belief that holt who was a favorite in the most sumptuous residence on the boulevard besides being well known in local dramatic circles and who bore the best of reputations in the bank was temporarily out of his mind as he had been distressed by pains in the head for some time past meantime the bonding company which had fully covered the employees of the bank by a joint bond of two hundred thousand dollars had its detectives working with the police on the case as soon as he read the paper john took a trolley into vernon and called on the president of the bank john's face drooped with the sorrow of the disgrace the president received him john staggered into the room groaning i have just learned in the newspaper of the terrible news about my brother i have come we hope it's just a case of aphasia we're sure he'll turn up all right insisted the president i wish i could believe it but as i have told you jasper is not a good man he drinks and smokes and play-acts and makes a god of stylish clothes good lord that's no reason for jumping to the conclusion that he's an embezzler i pray you may be right but meanwhile i wish to give you any assistance i can i shall make it my sole duty to see that my brother is brought to justice if it proves that he is guilty good on you mumbled the president despite this example of john's rigid honor he could not get himself to like the man john was standing beside him thrusting his stupid face into his the president pushed his hair a foot farther away and said disagreeably as a matter of fact we were thinking of searching your house if i remember you live in rosebank yes and of course i shall be glad to have you search every inch of it or anything else i can do i feel that i share fully with my twin brother in this unspeakable sin i'll turn over the key of my house to you at once there is also a shed at the back where jasper used to keep his automobile when he came to see me he produced a large rusty old-fashioned door key and held it out adding the address is twenty seven humbert avenue rosebank oh it won't be necessary i guess said the president somewhat shamed irritably waving off the key but i just want to help somehow what can i do who is in the language of the newspapers who is the detective on the case i'll give him any help tell you what you do go see mr scanlon of the mercantile trust and bonding company and tell him all you know i shall i take my brother's crime on my shoulders otherwise i'd be committing the sin of cain you are giving me a chance to try to expiate our joint sin and as brother jeremiah bonfish was wont to say it is a blessing to have an opportunity to expiate a sin no matter how painful the punishment may seem to be to the mere physical being as i may have told you i am an accept member of the soul hope fraternity and though we are free from cant and dogma it is our firm belief then for ten dreary minutes john holt sermonized quoted forgotten books and quaint ungenerous elders twisted bitter pride and clumsy mysticism into fanatical spider-web the president was a churchgoer an ardent supporter of missionary funds for forty years a pew-holder at st simeon's church but he was alternately bored to a chill shiver and roused to wrath against this self-righteous zealot when he had rather rudely got rid of john holt he complained to himself 
curse it i oughtn't to but i must say i prefer jasper the sinner to john the saint Ugh, what a smell of damp cellars the fellow has he must spend all his time picking potatoes say by thunder i remember that jasper had the infernal nerve to tell me once that if he ever robbed the bank i was to call john in i know why now john is the kind of egotistical fool that would muddle up any kind of a systematic search well jasper sorry but i'm not going to have anything more to do with john than i can help john had gone to the mercantile trust and bonding company had called on mr scandling and was now wearying him by a detailed and useless account of jasper's early years and recent vices he was turned over to the detective employed by the bonding company to find jasper the detective was a hard noisy man who found john even more tedious john insisted on his coming up to examine the house in rosebank and the detective did so but sketchily trying to escape john spent at least five minutes in showing him the shed where jasper had sometimes kept his car he also attempted to interest the detectives in his precious but spotty books he unlocked one section of the case dragged down a four-volume set of sermons and started to read them aloud the detective interrupted yeah that's great stuff but i guess we aren't going to find your brother hiding behind those books the detective got away as soon as possible after insistently explaining to john that if they could use his assistance they would let him know if i can only expiate yeah sure that's all right wailed the detective fairly running toward the gate john made one more visit to vernon that day he called on the chief of city police he informed the chief that he had taken the bonding company's detective through his house but wouldn't the police consent to search it also he wanted to expiate the chief patted john on the back advised him not to feel responsible for his brother's guilt and begged skip along now very busy as john walked to the soul hook meeting that evening dozens of people murmured that it was his brother who had robbed the lumber national bank his head was bowed with a shame at the meeting he took jasper's sin upon himself and prayed that jasper would be caught and receive the blessed healing of punishment the others begged john not to feel that he was guilty was he not one of the sole hope brethren who alone in this wicked and perverse generation were assured of salvation on thursday on saturday morning on tuesday and on friday john went into the city to call on the president of the bank and the detective twice the president saw him and was infinitely bored by his sermons the third time he sent word that he was out the fourth time he saw john but curtly explained that if john wanted to help them the best thing he could do was to stay away the detective was out all four times john smiled meekly and ceased to try to help them dust began to gather on certain candy boxes on the lower shelf of his bookcase save for one of them which he took out now and then always after he had taken it out a man with faded brown hair and a wrinkled black suit a man signing himself r j smith would send a fair-sized money order from the post office at south vernon to john holt at rosebank as he had been doing for more than six months these money orders could not have amounted to more than twenty-five dollars a week but that was even more than an ascetic like john holt needed by day john sometimes cashed these at the rosebank post office but usually as had been his custom he cashed them at his favorite grocery when he went out in the evening in conversation with the commuter neighbor who every evening walked out and smoked an after-dinner cigar in the yard at the right john was frank about the whole lamentable business of his brother's defalcation he wondered he said if he had not shut himself up with his studies too much and neglected his brother the neighbor ponderously advised john to get out more john let himself be persuaded at least to the extent of taking a short walk every afternoon and of letting his literary solitude be disturbed by the delivery of milk meat and groceries he also went to the public library and in the reference room glanced at books on central and south america as though he was planning to go south some day but he continued his religious studies it may be doubted if previous to the embezzlement 
john had worked very consistently on his book about revelation all that the world had ever seen of it was a jumble of quotations from theological authorities presumably the crime of his brother shocked him into more concentrated study more patient writing for during the year after his brother's disappearance a year in which the bonding company gradually gave up the search and came to believe that jasper was dead john became fanatically absorbed in somewhat nebulous work the days and nights drifted together in meditation in which he lost sight of realities and seemed through the clouds of the flesh to see flashes from the towered cities of the spirit it has been asserted that when jasper holt acted a role he veritably lived it no one can ever determine how great an actor was lost in the smug bank teller to him were imperial triumphs denied yet he was not without material reward for playing his most subtle part he received ninety seven thousand dollars it may be that he earned it certainly for the risk entailed it was but a fair payment jasper had meddled with the mystery of personality and was in peril of losing all consistent purpose of becoming a wandering jew of the spirit a strangled body walking End of part three part four of the willow walk by sinclair lewis this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Perard. part four the sharp pointed willow leaves had twisted and fallen after the dreary rains of october bark had peeled from the willow trunks leaving gashes of bare wood that was a wet and sickly yellow through the denuded trees bulked the solid stone of john holt's house the patches of earth were greasy between the tawny knots of grass stems the bricks of the walk were always damp now the world was hunched up in this pervading chill as melancholy as the sick earth seemed the man who in a slaty twilight paced the willow walk his step was slack his lips moved with the intensity of his meditation over his wrinkled black suit and bleak shirt bosom was a worn overcoat the velvet collar turned green he was considering there's something to all this i begin to see i don't know what it is i do see but there's lights supernatural world that makes food and bed seem ridiculous i am i really am beyond the law i make my own law why shouldn't i go beyond the law of vision and see the secrets of life but i send and i must repent some day i need not return the money i see now that it was given me so that i could lead this life of contemplation but the ingratitude to the president to the people who trusted me am i but the most miserable of sinners and as the blind voices i hear conflicting voices some praising me for my courage some rebuking he knelt on the slimy black surface of a wooden bench beneath the willows and as dusk clothed him round about he prayed it seemed to him that he prayed not in words but in vast confusing dreams the words of a language larger than human tongues when he had exhausted himself he slowly entered the house he locked the door there was nothing definite of which he was afraid but he was never comfortable with the door unlocked by candlelight he prepared his austere supper dry toast an egg cheap green tea with thin milk as always as it had happened after every meal now for eighteen months he wanted a cigarette when he had eaten but did not take one he paced into the living room and through the long still hours of the evening he read an ancient book all footnotes and cross-references about the numerology of the prophetic books and the number of the beast he tried to make notes for his own book on revelation that scant pile of sheets covered with writing in a small finicky hand thousands of other sheets he had covered through whole nights he had written but always he seemed with tardy pen to be racing after thoughts that he could never quite catch and most of what he had written he had savagely burned but some day he would make a masterpiece 
he was feeling toward the greatest discovery that mortal men had encountered everything he had determined was a symbol not just this holy sign and that but all physical manifestations with frightened exultation he tried his new power of divination the hanging lamp swung tinnily he ventured if the arc of that moving radiance touches the edge of the bookcase then it will be a sign that i am to go to south america under an entirely new disguise and spend my money he shuddered he watched the lamp's unbearably slow swing the moving light almost touched the bookcase he gasped then it receded it was a warning he quaked would he never leave this place of brooding and of fear which he had thought so clever a refuge he suddenly saw it all i ran away and hid in a prison man isn't caught by justice he catches himself again he tried he speculated as to whether the number of pencils on the table was greater or less than five if greater then he had sinned if less then he was veritably beyond the law he began to lift books and papers looking for pencils he was coldly sweating with the suspense of the test suddenly he cried am i going crazy he fled to his prosaic bedroom he could not sleep his brain was smouldering with confused inklings of mystic numbers and hidden warnings he woke from a half sleep more vision haunted than any waking thought and cried i must go back and confess but i can't i can't when i was too clever for them i can't go back and let them win i won't let those fools just sit tight and still catch me it was a year and a half since jasper had disappeared sometimes it seemed a month and a half sometimes gray centuries john's will-power had been shrouded with curious puttering studies long heavy breathing sittings with the ouija board on his lap midnight hours when he had fancied that tables had tapped and crackling coals had spoken now that the second autumn of his seclusion was creeping into winter he was conscious that he had not enough initiative to carry out his plans for going to south america the summer before he had boasted to himself that he would come out of hiding and go south leaving such a twisty trail as only he could make but oh it was too much trouble he hadn't the joy in play-acting which had carried his brother jasper through his preparations for flight he had killed jasper holt and for a miserable little pile of paper money he had become a mouldy recluse he hated his loneliness but still more did he hate his only companions the members of the soul hope fraternity that pious shrill seamstress that surly carpenter that tight-lipped housekeeper that old shouting man with the unseemly freeze of whiskers they were so unimaginative their meetings were all the same the same persons rose in the same order and made the same intimate announcements to the deity that they alone were his elect at first it had been an amusing triumph to be accepted as the most eloquent among them but that had become commonplace and he resented their daring to be familiar with him who was he felt the only man of all men living who beyond the illusions of the world saw the strange beatitude of higher souls it was at the end of november during a wednesday meeting at which a red-faced man had for a half hour maintained that he couldn't possibly sin that the cumulative ennui burst in john holt's brain he sprang up he snarled you make me sick all of you you think you're so certain of sanctification that you can't do wrong so did i once now i know that we are all miserable sinners really are you all say you are but you don't believe it i tell you that you there that have just been yammering and you brother judkins with the long twitching nose and i i i most unhappy of men we must repent confess expiate our sins and i will confess right now i stole terrified he darted out of the hall and hatless coatless tumbled through the main street of rosebank not ceased till he had locked himself in his house he was frightened because he had almost betrayed his secret 
it agonized because he had not gone on really confessed and gained the only peace he could ever know now the peace of punishment he never returned to soul hope hall indeed for a week he did not leave his house save for midnight prowling in the willow walk quite suddenly he became desperate with the silence he flung out of the house not stopping to lock or even close the front door he raced uptown no topcoat over his rotting garments only an old gardener's cap on his thick brown hair people stared at him he bore it with resigned fury he entered a lunchroom hoping to sit inconspicuously and hear men talking normally about him the attendant at the counter gaped john heard a mutter from the cashier's desk there's that crazy hermit all of the half-dozen young men loafing in the place were looking at him he was so uncomfortable that he could not eat even the milk and sandwich he had ordered he pushed them away and fled a failure in the first attempt to dine out that he had made in eighteen months a lamentable failure to revive that jasper Holt whom he had coldly killed he entered a cigar store and bought a box of cigarettes he took joy out of throwing away his asceticism but when on the street he lighted a cigarette it made him so dizzy that he was afraid he was going to fall he had to sit down on the curb people gathered he staggered to his feet and up an alley for hours he walked making and discarding the most contradictory plans to go to the bank and confess to spend the money riotously and never confess it was midnight when he returned to his house before it he gasped the front door was open he chuckled with relief as he remembered that he had not closed it he sauntered in he was passing the door of the living room going directly up to his bedroom when his foot struck an object the size of a book but hollow sounding he picked it up it was one of the book-like candy boxes and it was quite empty frightened he listened there was no sound he crept into the living room and lighted the lamp the doors of the bookcase had been wrenched open every book had been pulled out on the floor all of the candy boxes which that evening had contained almost ninety six thousand dollars were in a pile and all of them were empty he searched for ten minutes but the only money he found was one five dollar bill which had fluttered under the table in his pocket he had one dollar and sixteen cents john holt had six dollars and sixteen cents no job no friends and no identity end of part four part five of the willow walk by sinclair lewis this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by mac Rard. part five when the president of the lumber national bank was informed that john holt was waiting to see him he scowled lord i'd forgotten that minor plague must be a year since he's been here oh let him no hanged if i will tell him i'm too busy to see him that is unless he's got some news about jasper pump him and find out the president's secretary sweetly confided to john i'm so sorry but the president is in conference just now what was it you wanted to see him about is there any news about about your brother there is not miss i am here to see the president on the business of the lord oh if that's all i'm afraid i can't disturb him i will wait wait he did through all the morning through the lunch hour when the president hastened out past him then into the afternoon till the president was unable to work with the thought of that scarecrow out there and sent for him well well what is it this time john i'm pretty busy no news about jasper eh no news sir but jasper himself i am jasper holt his sin is my sin yes yes i know all that stuff twin brothers twin souls share responsibility you don't understand there isn't any twin brother there isn't any john holt i am jasper i invented an imaginary brother and disguised myself why don't you recognize my voice 
while john leaned over the desk his two hands upon it and smiled wistfully the president shook his head and soothed no i'm afraid i don't sounds like good old religious john to me jasper was a cheerful efficient sort of crook why his laugh but i can laugh the dreadful croak which john uttered was the cry of an evil bird of the swamps the president shuddered under the edge of the desk his fingers crept toward the buzzer by which he summoned his secretary they stopped as john urged look this wig it's a wig see i am jasper he had snatched off the brown thatch he stood expectant a little afraid the president was startled but he shook his head and sighed you poor devil wig all right but i wouldn't say that hair was much like jasper's he motioned toward the mirror in the corner of the room john wavered to it and indeed he saw that his hair had turned from jasper's thin sleek blackness to a straggle of damp gray locks writhing over a yellow skull he begged pitifully oh can't you see i am jasper i stole ninety seven thousand dollars from the bank i want to be punished i want to do anything to prove why i've been at your house your wife's name is evelyn my salary here was my dear boy don't you suppose that jasper might have told you all these interesting facts i'm afraid the worry of this has pardon me if i'm frank but i'm afraid it's turned your head a little john there isn't any john there isn't there isn't i believe that a little more easily if i hadn't met you before jasper disappeared give me a piece of paper you know my writing with clutching claws john seized a sheet of bank stationery and tried to write in the round script of jasper during the past year and a half he had filled thousands of pages with the small finicky hand of john now though he tried to prevent it after he had traced two or three words in large but shaky letters the writing became smaller more pinched less legible even while john wrote the president looked at the sheet and said easily afraid it's no use that isn't jasper's fist see here i want you to get away from rosebank go to some farm work outdoors cut off this fuming and fussing get some fresh air in your lungs the president rose and purred now i'm afraid i have some work to do he paused waiting for john to go john fiercely crumpled the sheet and hurled it away tears were in his weary eyes he wailed is there nothing i can do to prove i am jasper why certainly you can produce what's left of the ninety seven thousand john took from his ragged waistcoat pocket a five dollar bill and some change here's all there is ninety six thousand of it was stolen from my house last night sorry though he was for the madman the president could not help laughing then he tried to look sympathetic and he comforted well that's hard luck old man um let's see you might produce some parents or relatives or somebody to prove that jasper never did have a twin brother my parents are dead and i've lost track of their kin i was born in england father came over when i was six there might be some cousins or some old neighbors but i don't know probably impossible to find out in these war times without going over there well i guess we'll have to let it go old man the president was pressing the buzzer for his secretary and gently begging her show mr holt out please from the door john desperately tried to add you will find my car sunk the door had closed behind him the president had not listened the president gave orders that never for any reason was john holt to be admitted to his office again he telephoned to the bonding company that john holt had now gone crazy that they would save trouble by refusing to admit him john did not try to see them he went to the county jail he entered the keeper's office and said quietly i have stolen a lot of money but i can't prove it will you put me in jail the keeper shouted get out of here you hoboes always spring that when you want a good warm lodging for the winter why the devil don't you go to work with a shovel in the sand pits they are paying two seventy five a day yes sir said john timorously where are they End of part five.
End of The Willow Walk by Sinclair Lewis.